Appreciate that, Amanda. Appreciate your gifts. We want to do that. Turn your Bible to the book of Ruth as we finish up our series talking about a love story about us. We're going to pick up at uh, verse 7, and I'll read through the end of the chapter. I, I heard an uh, interesting uh, statement uh, last week, I guess the week before last. Um, someone said that if, if Christianity isn't hard, you probably aren't one. That's what, <laughs> saying that if it wasn't hard to do and follow and trust, then you might not be a Christian. And you think, man, wait a minute, that, that is uh, a hard statement to make. But the truth of the matter is, when it comes to your relationship with God, to follow God, to truly follow Him, to trust Him, uh, it's a burden. It's difficult. It, uh, it requires a walk with the Lord that uh, requires sacrifice and pain and difficulty. And in a lot of ways, um, the truth of the matter is, uh, the difficulty of Christianity is that if you keep score of your own life, um, you feel like you're not doing a very good job, uh, that the score's not very good. Uh, you could imagine, uh, and you probably have had moments where you have thought to yourself, I, I would love to get more involved, I would love to do this, or I would love to do that, but the truth of the matter is, I'm, I'm just not one of those kind of people. Uh, my life's not really where it ought to be for me to be that kind of person. I, I'm, I'm not uh, comfortable enough with my faith. I'm not comfortable enough with where I am walking with God. So I'm not the kind of person that can share my faith. Because look at my life. I can't share my faith at work. I can't share my faith. I can't lead my family. If you're a man and you feel like you can't lead your family in prayer at your home and you think to yourself, I can't do that because of who I am. They see me. For who I am and, and what I am. You know, that's a lie that Satan loves to hang over the head of those who belong to God. He loves to do that. He loves to tell you that you are not worthy of the calling that God has put on your life to be part of his mission. He loves to tell you that because you have botched it up, mom, as a disciplinarian and the last time with your kiddos, that you should not at any point try to do it again. You should not try to lead them to understand God because you made such a mess of things before. And see, this lie comes from the accuser of the brethren. Satan loves to take our lives and continue to push us down because we say to ourselves we are not worthy of the calling that God puts on us. And I will tell you that if any of you deemed yourself or if I deemed myself worthy of the calling God put on me, that would be the one identifying truth that would prove I wasn't worthy of the calling God put upon me. And so as we've been looking through this book of Ruth, I want you to really see that where you are right now in your life and the circumstances and the difficulties and the things you've been through, the regrets that you have, the things that make you feel like there was an alternative plan that God had for you that you have now through your poor decisions, uh, maybe your lack of devotion or your uh, inability to function with enough faith to do it the way you knew God would want you to do it, I want you to see that those things that make you feel like you have knocked yourself off the track that God intended are exactly the things that God uses to work in your life to this point right now. You see, today we're going to talk about the book as a whole, the book of Ruth. And there's two fundamental things that we have to understand. If you were to talk about two points, two ideas, two concepts that sum up this whole book, here's what they are. The providence of God and the redemption of sinners. The providence of God and the redemption of sinners. Let's talk a little bit about providence. If you were to define that word and think about what it means to have providence in your life, here's what we're talking about. God is working out his plan in you and in me. Today, you could say to yourself, was it God's providential plan that I was supposed to be here today to hear this sermon? We can say what? Yes. Why? 
Well, my brother and sister, it's because you are on that pew right now. We don't have to worry about God's providence of whether you were supposed to be here. In fact, let me tell you something else that's very comforting. I don't have to worry about how many people are here today. You know why? Because of God's providence, who is here is who is here. And so the scriptures give us in this story of Ruth a picture of God's providence in the life of somebody that made a mess of it. In fact, I'm going to tell you something. You may have noticed this already, but the book of Ruth is not about Ruth. It really isn't. The book of Ruth is about Naomi. Because Naomi's life is really the bookend of this storyline. We start with seeing Naomi's life fall apart as she leaves the things of God. And then we see the final climactic end where things get restored. And I want you to look at that providence as we go forward. And then I'm going to talk about what a great moment you have been given today through God's providence, okay? So let's look at this. Ruth chapter 4. If you know where we're at, we're picking up this idea that Boaz has redeemed Ruth. He didn't have to do it. He was not the next of kin that would be required to do it, which he showed God's redemptive love and that he was willing to do it. He didn't do it out of obligation or law. He stepped up and was willing to do that. Ruth shows us what it means to be willing to serve and sacrifice, to put herself under his leadership. She's willing to reconcile this. And so we see that relationship that we have uh, where she connects to Naomi to her homeland. She also shows her willingness to serve and to be part of that culture, to be brought in with God through her relationship with Boaz. And so now we have this summary of what's going to happen between the two of them. And in this, we will see this connection between providence and redemption. Look with me at verse 7 of chapter 4, and I'll read to the end of the chapter. Now, this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm a a transaction, the one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other. And this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Chilion and Malon. Also, Ruth, the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of this native place. You are witnesses this day. Verse 11. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrathah and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. So Boaz takes the land of Naomi and redeems her and then also marries Ruth. Verse 13, so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife and he went into her and the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer. And may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the woman of the neighborhood gave him a name saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse and the father of David. I want you to see what providence provides for us. Now if you understand and are familiar with the story of Naomi's life, Naomi and her husband Elimelech chose during the midst of the famine of the judges of the Bible. She was going through a hard time. They didn't have the things that they need. They left the land of God, the house of bread, the house of Bethlehem. They left that in order to take care of themselves to avoid pain. There's not a person in this room who has walked with God who has not left 
pain in order to avoid the things of God. Have compromised their faith in order to avoid the things of God. In order to avoid pain in their life. And so what Naomi found out and what we find out and what we see in the prodigal story of God is that when you avoid the things of God, when you do not trust God, and the scriptures say that you go your own way, that there are consequences. Because the truth of the matter is the things of God are better for, the, for created man than the things that we feel in our heart. And so if you know the story and you remember if you've been walking this road with us, you know that what happens to Naomi is she watches everything around her fall apart. Her husband dies. Her sons die. She's left with these two daughters-in-law. She has nothing to say for her. She's not in her own land. She has left all of the things that are important. And she makes the decision to say, I need to go back to the stuff that matters. You know, all of you can tell that story, whether you have seen it in your own life or you have seen it in the life of church. I can tell you that there is a consistent theme that happens a lot of times, unfortunately, in our relationship with uh, those who are growing up in church. You'll see somebody who you worry about, they grow up, they hit adolescence. Maybe the connection or the discipleship or the investment of the church is not there. The family is not seeking to do, or at least they don't, it doesn't stick in the way it should. And so this child, maybe he or she, grows up and starts to wander a little bit from the things of God. The problem is that when you go down that road, it looks great, things are attractive, but the truth of the matter is there comes a moment when there is nothing else left. And if you are a parent and you have watched a child go through this, what you want to see is, and you hope has happened enough, is that in the times of prayer around the dinner table, in the Sunday school classes, or the repetitions of VBS over and over again, you hope that somewhere it's stuck in there, that there is a home for them where they are welcomed and they belong, and so you hope that they end up going back. And we can tell that story, can't we, of people who later in life who we have not seen through those younger years come wandering through the back door of a church building and they say, you know what? I need to come back home. And what I would tell you is when we look at Naomi's life and providence, what we see is we see someone who wandered away from the house of bread, who wandered away from the things of God, who wandered away from the things that mattered. But when the moment came, when she looked around and she had nothing left, she had nowhere else to go but home. And so that's what she did. Now, What's interesting about people who walk that road, and if you've ever had that experience, all of us can say, we can list things in our life that we regret that we think messed up the plan of God. I can tell you in my life, as I prepared this message this week, I thought to myself, times that I should have done this, or I shouldn't have done that, or if this would have happened, what would have been different for my life? You've probably been in that same boat where you've thought, you know what, I could have been this, I could have done that, but I wasn't what I should have been. Now, it is easy for us in moments like that to say, you know what, because I have messed up this plan, I'm going to have to handle this a little differently when it comes to God. My relationship with God, it can't be like everybody else's. I'm not serious enough. I've got this history of mistakes, so I can't really step out and teach. I'm just not the kind of person. I don't have the, pa the past that matches up with the opportunity for me to step out and serve. I'm just not the kind of person that has the resume, the spiritual resume, to be able to be a person to do the things God really wants to do in life. I've got to be one of these people that sits on the wayside. I have to be a pew sitter that kind of sits back and says, you know what, God's going to do some great things. I'm going to try to support those things as best I can. The truth of the matter, it's not for me because I'm just not 
what I ought to be to jump into that mission. And what I'm telling you is, then the providence of God, you are where you are in this moment because God used those things for you to come to this very point in this very Sunday for you to hear this very message about how providence connects to redemption. You see, because Naomi messed up her life. Naomi made a mess of things with her husband. They dumped the things of God. They abandoned the city. They left. Everything fell apart. Her whole life died around her. And she goes back and God says, In my plan, Naomi, I will redeem you. Now we read this storyline and we don't think about how important it is for Naomi's husband's lineage to be connected like this. Now we think about Elimelech and the fact that Ruth now has a baby with Boaz and how the line of Elimelech now gets connected. We don't really think about that because the truth of the matter is the definition of your life is not your lineage. Now, in some cases, that's the way it is. I can tell you um, that, you know, when you have two daughters, you think to yourself, you know, I want a boy. Just keep that name alive. I made that joke one time with my dad, and he said, man, I'll tell you what. And he said, I don't know if there ought to be any more Giles. He said, there's, there's a bunch of us out there. and Maybe we ought to end that. Which I thought, well, all right, Dad, there we go. God's providence, right? Well, he, here's the situation. I will tell you, there is that moment in the back of your mind where you think to yourself, I've got to continue my lineage. And that, that may be part of your life. It may be part of something you've dealt with. I want you to understand that is not the connection that you see to what Naomi's tied to. See, in Naomi's life, her whole purpose, in her understanding of her culture, her whole purpose was this inherited lineage. You survived because you had sons. Now, whether that's right or wrong, it doesn't really matter. The truth of the matter is that's the circumstances that she was in. And so for her, when her husband died and she comes back home, she is thinking to herself, I have messed my life up so bad, I can't do the thing I was supposed to do. My purpose is gone. My value is gone. In comes Ruth. Ruth marries Boaz. They have Obed. And then Naomi's purpose and her value in her life is restored through this relationship. Now we could look and we could say in the midst of providence, could Naomi have done that a better way? Well, yeah, I mean, if they had stayed in Bethlehem and Elimelech would have, you know, had his kiddos there and he wouldn't have gotten sick and they wouldn't have died in that circumstance. We can all do that. We can do that. And you can do that in your life and I can do that in mine. You can look back and say, I wish I wouldn't have done that. I deal with this a lot of times with Christians who have been through divorce. You know, you're always going to hear me tell you biblically that divorce is a sin. It is. So is lying. So many other things are sins. But you have to understand something. What you are now is the definition of what's going on in your life. That's the distinction between providence and redemption. You see, the thing that makes this story amazing is providence brings you to this point. And you guys have a resume, and I have a resume of things we did that we wish we wouldn't have done that brought us here. And here's what is amazing about the way providence ties with redemption. God says, there is no second class Christian. God says, there is no second class person whose history and past has broken them to the point that he cannot redeem them and use them to do his work and fulfill his mission. That is the gospel. And so when you look at this book of Ruth, what I want you to be able to see is, yes, there is sin in your past. Yes, you have made mistakes. Yes, you come into this moment a sloppy mess with a resume that you have edited the things you wish you wouldn't have done. There's not a person here who acknowledges sin in their life that does not have things that they regret, that they have said 
or they have done. But God has taken those things through his providential plan and he has brought you to this point where you can now join him in the things he is doing from this point forward. And that's what we see with Naomi. Naomi's inheritance gets put back to place. Now, it's not the way it should have been, but it's the way God intended it. She gets the lineage and the inheritance that she always wanted. She's back in Bethlehem, and she has been redeemed. The relationship of Ruth and Boaz is the picture of what God does to put back his sovereign plan through your life. Now, the thing that's great about Naomi is that when Naomi holds this baby in her hands, she's looking at God's redemptive plan to restore her, even though she has made such a big mess of the things in her life. And see, that's what's available today to us. That's what's available to you today. To be part of this bigger, grand story. I want you to read the rest of it. Read verse 18. I want you to see this. Uh, this. Now, I'm, I'm going to go through these names like I really know how to pronounce them. So, just wish me well. All right. So, here we go. Verse 18 says, Now, these are the generations of Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Aminadab. Aminadab, the fa- father of Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon, and Salmon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Obed, and Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David. Do you know why that is important? From the line of David comes a little Jewish carpenter out of a little city um, called Galilee that you may be familiar with. But it is Naomi's restored life that brings about the lineage that brings us the Savior who redeems us all. And so here's what I want to tell you today. If you have a desire in your heart to do God's work and be part of His mission in a way you've never done before, nothing in your past will stop that because of what Jesus has done. And if you have come here and you are deep in regret and feel like you have sinned in a way that has made you second class in the relationship to God because others don't have the same mistakes and the same brokenness that you do, I want to tell you because of the redemption of Jesus Christ, that is not true. You can be part of and are part of this mission of God. And so the story that we have to present to the world is not this story of get your act together. But a story of God takes messes and makes his missionaries. You see, what happened here was all of the things that we have done and messed up in our life have brought us to the point where we can do his work. Could there be anybody better to talk about how you should be faithful when things are difficult than Naomi? I doubt it. Don't you think you see her sitting there with Obed as he's growing up? And she's telling him about Elimelech. And she's saying, let me tell you, your granddad and I made a bad decision. We messed up in some ways that we just don't want you to go through. We did some things that if we had it to do over again, we wouldn't have done. But let me tell you something. In the midst of all that, God is faithful. He's so faithful, Obed. He is so faithful that he has brought us back to his city. He has brought our family back together. And you are part of God's incredible plan. You see, the reason that I felt the Lord leading me to name this a love story about us is because the truth of the matter is this is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Messed up people being fixed by God's providential power and His redemptive work in Jesus Christ. There is nothing better. It is worth sharing. And so let me just take a little pressure off. You were messed up when you got here. You'll be messed up when you leave. 
But God uses messed up people because of this wonderful Messiah in Jesus. Let me show you something interesting about your life. Go, go to Romans. Whoop. Go to Romans 8. I'll take you to two passages today. Romans 8 verse 28 says this. Wait for those pages to quit turning. I love that sound, by the way. I know it's cool to have like iPads and stuff, but I'm a paper Bible guy all day long. All right? I think Jesus was too. No, that's not right. <laughs> Sorry. I should have said that. 828. And we know that for those who are called according to his purpose, And we, sorry, verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. God is working out your mess for his glory. And there is no better truth than that. Hold that place. Go somewhere else. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Now I'm still getting to know you. You're still getting to know me. But I bet there's some people. You've got some stuff you probably don't want the preacher to know. And i got some stuff I don't want you to know. But you know what God does? God uses that stuff. When you give it to him. Look at 2 Corinthians verse 1. I want you to look at verse, or chapter 1 verse 3. Here's what it says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Father of mercies and God of all comfort. Look at this. Who comforts us in all our affliction. So that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction. With the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Don't just blow by that. Let, let, that, let that weigh on you. Listen to that. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Nobody is a better expert on what not to do than the ones who have done it and been forgiven by it. And God says he will take your mess and he will use it for his mission. And all these things will work together for his purpose. Now does that mean we go out and we sin more? No. What does it mean? It means that we can jump back into that mission and glorify him because he uses us right where we're at. So here's what I'm going to say to you. God is doing some incredible things at FBA. And we need more workers. We need more people to step out. We need people to step out and be uncomfortable. We need people who have never shared their faith before to go out there and share their faith. Not because they have their life all together, but because they know that God redeems people like them. And they can share that same redemption with people who are in the same mess they are. And if you've got that little tug in your heart to do more and be more and serve more and step out in faith and grow more and trust more and be more, let me tell you, that was put there by God and God is growing you to trust Him and know Him more. And that's great. Don't neglect that because you feel like you're not qualified. Because the truth is, Jesus' lineage has a half Moabite kid in it. And it's not because it was a good thing. It was because there was a big messed up part of the plan. And God said, oh, no, no. 
I got this. No surprises for me. This just makes this gospel even more true. You're here because of providence. And because of Jesus, you get the opportunity for redemption. Let's pray. God, we love you. We thank you. We rejoice in you. There is not a power in this world that can compete with the power of your Holy Spirit in changing lives than using broken, sinful people. And so, Fathers, we come to this time. May it be your gospel. May it be its power. May the gospel continue to work and bear fruit in the hearts of the people of First Baptist Alcoa. I pray, Father, that we would be people willing to step out on faith, people who are willing to do more and be more and walk with you. I pray, God, that you would continue to lead us and guide us to do your work. Lord, I pray that people would not look at their past as a burden that destroys their future. And so, Lord, I lift up people today. I pray, God, that if there are some that need to lay it down today, lay their past down, maybe what they do is they come forward today and they pray and they lay that down. Maybe they say, God, I'm going to give this to you. I know I'm not a second-class follower. I'm going to lay this down on a walk with you. I pray, God, that your Spirit would lead them to do that. I pray, Lord, that every single one of us would know that we do not stand on our own merits in our relationship to you, but that you have a grand plan through your son, Jesus. I pray, Lord, that First Baptist Alcoa would stand on that Jesus and nothing else. It's in his name we pray.